Hey, it's Jay. Here's episode eight. And how do you think one should go about dealing with this problem of uh, Nazism or people who pretend to be Nazis and parade in swastikas and annoy and frighten other people? Do you have any suggestions how this man yeah, should well, be? I, when it comes to me, I'm as as a, as a as a man which went through hell. I'm very, very against it. And now, but what practical things should be done to to uh, eliminate this kind of nuisance? They shouldn't be allowed. I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Evelyn Beatrice Hall wrote those words in a biography while channeling the thoughts of Voltaire. It, and other quotes like it, get repeated often to describe the principle of free speech. Here's a few other good ones you may have heard or seen used in debates. If liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. That's George Orwell. What is freedom of expression? Without the freedom to offend, it ceases to exist. That's Salman Rushdie. They go on. You, lo- you know these quotes. People like these quotes. I like these quotes, too. And we sort of carry them around like little free speech fortune cookies to crack open in a tense moment of a debate or to frame a moment when someone gets emotional and attempts to quiet an upsetting voice in their vicinity. They're snappy quotes and they cut to the truth and are very useful. But they're easy to say and they're easy to write. They're harder to actually live through. So imagine this, you are a proud Jew and you are a civil liberties lawyer. And one day a neo-Nazi knocks on your door and claims that his first amendment rights are being violated because a town is denying his right to host a public march for his group. Oh, and this particular town has a significantly large percentage of Holocaust survivors. Well, this exact scenario happened to the guest in this episode. The guest is David Goldberger, and the place was Skokie, Illinois, in the year 1977. The Nazi who walked through his door was a man named Frank Collin. Here's some sound from Frank Collin and his group in 1977 you could get a flavor of sort of what they sounded like this is our community this is our neighborhood and we're going to keep it our neighborhood we're not going to let any rabble of jungle primitives come in here and think that they can force us out all right well i'm not going to be printing that oh well no first well we're not printing what they say either about that no you print whatever you choose to put in well the best thing i can say for you frank you're doing a wonderful job thank you very much sir really appreciate it well it's it's everybody here this is a real cooperative effort Good job. Well, we kept them out today, that's for sure, anyway. Well, let's, let's, keep, let's keep it there. Let's keep it that way, for sure. Remember to vote for us, too, this November. We're running for U.S. Congress. You white power on the ballot. First time that's a- I'll let David tell the story in the interview since he actually lived through it and can tell it better than I could ever. So instead, I want to use this introduction to put a thought about philosophy in your mind. The theme keeps emerging in the conversation that you're about to hear of the role of the police. Obviously, this issue has surfaced in incredibly tense ways in the last few months, and I paired this episode intentionally with last week's conversation with Coleman Hughes and Chloe Valdery on Black Panther. We started to discuss this a bit, but this episode is really where I think we can dive deeper into the complexities. Coleman and I, in season one, discussed a a sort of pseudo-fallacy of argumentation, which I'm going to briefly revisit. It's called the continuum fallacy, or sometimes called the heap fallacy. So it goes like this. If I start with one grain of sand and slowly start adding grains of sand one by one, when would I say that I have made a heap of sand? rather than just say a bit of sand? Or when does it become a pile of sand or a mound of sand? Does the heap happen at the 3,652nd grain of sand, but no sooner? The fallacy would be to conclude that heaps of sand don't exist since we can't find a specific point where sand groups become heaps of sand. This fallacy is really quite common and it's really pretty maddening to encounter. 
But now consider instead of heaps of sand, a kind of principle like reasonable doubt. How many facts and uncertainties does one need to expose in a murder trial in order to reasonably doubt the guilt of an accused person? When does reasonable happen? Or consider something like guaranteed safety. Go all the way down to the lake and jump in. I don't want you in my neighborhood. Damn right I don't. If a political rally is likely to create a lot of tension in a community, and there's a chance of violence, how much of a likelihood of violence must exist before the safety of protesters and anti-protesters cannot be secured to a moral degree? So the heap fallacy lurks under all of this. The temptation to say that any amount of likelihood of violence existing justifies the preventing of the event in the first place is equivalent to saying that all clumps of sand are heaps. These lines, though, are phantoms when you look closely. The problem with society, though, is that you have to draw the lines somewhere. This is called a law. The drinking age is set at 21 years old. Is there a magical moment when a 20-year, 364-day-old human suddenly turns into a fully mature adult at midnight capable of drinking responsibly and safely? Of course not. It's just a line on the continuum that we drew because we had to draw it somewhere. It's not entirely arbitrary. You hope that it is informed by knowledge about brain development and psychological maturity. It wouldn't make any sense to set the drinking age at 11 years old or 60 years old. Just like calling two grains of sand or two billion grains of sand a heap would also feel pretty off. But to emphasize the hazy nature of these lines philosophically, the voting age and military age is 18. The driving age is 16 and 17 in some states. You'd think that all of these are informed by similar ideas of biological maturation. Lines on the continuum can be hazy in philosophy. We can argue about them. But they can't be hazy once we bring them out into a legal society. So of course, the next task is to enforce these semi-arbitrary lines that we've drawn. This naturally is called law enforcement. So let's bring this to the topic of this episode, free speech. The right to free speech, by its nature, will always exist in some tension with the right to have safety. There's always a chance that speech will cause an eruption of physical violence which threatens onlookers and demonstrators alike. That's where concepts like the fighting words doctrine and clear and present danger, false speech, and hate speech laws come into play. We'll, we'll talk about all of these in the upcoming conversation. But whatever we decide as a society in our moral philosophy classrooms about free speech, we end up drawing a line which aims to ensure safety and ensure free protest. This line becomes definitionally a line of law enforcement. Lately, this line has been very literal and visible with police standing between humans on the brink of violence. As mentioned in the previous episode, this is not an easy job and it's only getting harder. So there's really two things I want you to keep in mind during this episode. One is to simply hear from someone who lived through and seemingly passed a kind of test of his values that most of us will never face and many would crumble in the face of. It's really an honor having him on Dilemma to tell the story of Skokie. The other is that once these principles are outlined and even defended in our quiet moments, there's another part of the equation that is necessary and that is the physical task of law enforcement. So I'll be back at the end with some thoughts on the ACLU itself, which we hint at in the later portion of this conversation, and maybe it's drift into some dangerous areas. So now, here you go. Dilemma, Season 2, Episode 8, Your Right to Say It with David Goldberger. It's a, it's a huge honor talking to you. Um, I consider what you've done with your life to be rather remarkable. You've played a pivotal role in American history and a chapter uh, that I know has been told before. And we're going to talk about things that I know you've talked about for, for 50 years now. Um, but it seems to be 
the issues and the the hornet's nest that you threw yourself into with the famous Skokie case is something that we have to keep talking about because the lessons of it keep arising, yeah. possibly being forgotten, et cetera. So when did you get involved and why did you say yes when this guy, Frank Collin, well, came to you? Yeah. All right. It, it, the answer is more complicated than it sounds. But um, when I was the legal director of the ACLU in Illinois, we represented just a broad range of clients. Uh, by the time he came in, I'd represented the Communist Party to get him on the ballot, represented newspaper men, who were uh, subpoenaed before the grand jury and so forth, uh, high school students. And um, we had represented this guy previously to get him a permit to hold his uh, hold a parade or public assembly in Chicago in uh, Marquette Park. In any case, he called me and told me he'd been served by uh, the village of Skokie because he informed them he was coming to have his group picket in front of the village hall. I got a call on a Tuesday night, and the hearing was the next morning. I um, called my general counsel and explained the situation. Basically, this was going to be a a litigation about a prior restraint on speech because everything he planned to do was uh, obnoxious as it was. It was classic First Amendment activity. At the time, I was a little naive about how explosive it was. I said, well, I'm going to appear with him in court tomorrow because I can't get any volunteers to take the case, which is how we have a lot of um, cases handled at the ACLU. And he said, who was a great guy, he said, David, I order you to take the case. I said, well, what are you ordering me to take the case? You're my general counsel, but I have independent authority to take the case. He said, David... If they come after you, they're going to have to come after me, too. So let's get on with this. At wow. that point, I began to get an inkling of what might be coming. And so to set the stage, this was like 1970s. Chicago. 1977. Yeah. And it seems like and the, the area around Skokie and Chicago seemed to be, you know, spilling over into the streets with these semi-frequent violent clashes between this particular neo-Nazi group. Well... He had tried to, he, he tried to hold assemblies on the south side near his headquarters, and there was there were scuffles surrounding mm-hmm. those um, uh, assemblies. And he had some where he was successful in Marquette Park, which was a few blocks from his headquarters. Uh, but at this point, he was not yet that visible. He was trying to uh, get permits to go uh, to various suburbs. Mm-hmm. And finally, everybody was turning him down. So he just decided, I'm going to Skokie to pick it in front of the village hall because the um, Skokie Park District turned me down. And I'm going to have signs that say free speech for white people, mm-hmm. free speech. And we'll be in our neo-Nazi uniforms and we'll have our banners and so forth. At the time, it seemed to me a, a fairly straightforward First Amendment case. We went to court the next day, and the judge issued a temporary restraining order, which we tried to appeal quickly in the Illinois courts because he wanted to go out the following weekend, and the court sat on it. Uh, We went first to the Illinois Court of Appeals, and they sat on it, and then we went to the state Supreme Court, and they sat on it, at which point I said, let's go for broke, and we filed a petition to stay the injunction in the U.S. Supreme Court so that we could file uh, pleadings there. And at that point, all hell broke loose because what happened was we didn't hear anything from the court. And then I got a call from the clerk of the court saying, you've won five to four. The court treated your motion, uh, to make a long story short, as uh, an application for certiorari, which they granted. They treated it as a brief on the merits. They looked at the response of the village of Skokie, and they issued an order saying to Skokie, basically, and to the state Supreme Court, more to the point, either decide the case or let them march, one or the other, right away. And that's when uh, it hit the press, and the community went Frankly, it went wild at that point. And then I mean, the case did get clogged in the courts for another seven or eight months. 
even in spite of the ruling by the U.S. Supreme Court. But when the co Supreme Court weighed in on it, everybody's attention was drawn to it. And it was during that seven or eight months that the really the crescendo of opposition began to build. So to back up to the sort of the, your your moral position, maybe philosophical position, obviously the headlines now, you know, 50 years later, it's like Goldberger <laughs> defending the Nazis, right? Like that seems to get to the headline, right? Not and, exactly it, an Irish name, yes. Yeah, yeah, not exactly an Irish name. And it's and like all, it, history tends to distill these very complicated issues and legal intricacies to like this maybe unfair you know, headline that that now just becomes the thing that that walks around with you, but it, and is and you're in an interesting position in history to to still be here witnessing the story of something that you lived through get distilled to maybe this unfair tagline, but but if I ask a question about that tagline, it is does that hold up true? Is this as simple as you believed in the principle of free speech basically means? to defend the free speech, even of people you find abhorrent. Is that is that where you were coming in as a, as a young? Yeah, no question about it. it. To me, it was just a very simple and straightforward case. And it was my view. If they can shut this guy down, they can shut down anybody. Right. Yeah. And th that that's a difficult position to take. I, I mean, I'm just want to put sort of the, the pin here. I read that the ACLU lost 100,000 members. Well, that may be. I think we their estimates, I heard, heard estimates closer to 50,000 members and then some yeah. people who don't like what we did think that we didn't lose all that many people. But um, either way, yes, it was, there was a hemorrhage uh, within the membership. But you do, you still think to this day you, you, you did the right thing, you would take the case if it was brought to you again today, right? Is that Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there's never been a, I mean, it's simple, straightforward, prior restraint on speech. Uh, uh, yes, the speech is offensive, but um, offensive speech in America, unlike Europe, is um, not punishable by law. It's mm -hmm. something that um, is part of the uh, marketplace of ideas that we have to live with. Did your friends and family members uh, weigh in on this at the time? Were they like, David, what the hell are you doing defending Nazis? Uh, Was it difficult most for you? Of, most of my friends, I mean, when it really got hot yeah. and, and most of my friends uh, circled the wagons around me to their credit. Some, mem most of them, my immediate family members and my aunts and uncles that I was close to, they too were with me, but there were some who absolutely were beside themselves. Hmm. And there was um, a story within the story and that is that my rabbi, you know, I'm a, I'm basically a a proud Jew, but not a religious Jew. Mm -hmm. um, my rabbi, uh, who was himself a Holocaust survivor, at one point offered to join others and sign. Who know, knew me well offered to sign on an ad in the newspaper saying the ACLU is not defending the Nazis; it's defending the First Amendment. Wow! But his congregation. I mean, I'd been raised in that congregation. I was years away from it. You know, this was down in the suburbs and I was in Chicago. They absolutely demanded that he get off of the ad, which he did mm -hmm. and on his deathbed. He apologized to me for getting off of the ad. He said, I failed you. And I said, no, you didn't, Rabbi. Each of us did what we had to do. But mm -hmm. in the meantime, he was now, I think, the senior rabbi and uh, the, the man who succeeded him as the actual, you know, the no, it was, he was the emeritus and the guy that was the actual rabbi excoriated me, I'm told, from the, um, from the pulpit. Wow. And that was my parents were still part of that congregation. So there, there was heat. Yeah, yeah. And, and there still is heat. I mean, do you, this is just a pure maybe moral philosophical uh, philosophical question or a legal question for you. Do you draw a line anywhere? I mean, we don't have of formalized course. hate speech laws. Yeah, and where, where would you draw it? Well, in, in um, to the extent that you can demonstrate that, um, and this is f basically out of the fighting words doctrine and the clear and present danger doctrine, you can demonstrate that there's going to be either reflexive violence, mm. uh, punch in the nose, so to speak, reflexively, 
or that there's going to be uh, actual physical disorder on the spot that the police cannot control, hmm. um, then you're talking clear and present danger or the modern equivalent. What would have had to have been present when Frank came to you? Like, like did you ask him, what are you going to be saying there? Yeah, are you gonna have yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it had to be, he had to be, engaged in advocacy of ideas, beliefs, or whatever have you, and not trying to incite violence or incite right. substantial law violation. And so, I mean, I've looked at some of the old footage. Yeah, there's signs said stuff, like you've said, free speech for whites and this kind of stuff. But it, was the swastika itself the symbol, another contentious issue? Yes. Oh, yeah, yes. And the, and the state court of appeals um, focused on the swastika and it focused also on the brown shirted uniforms which were mm. stormtrooper type uniforms and um so those were all there but it, it was position in the case and i think the right position even today that those kinds of symbols per se um, are protected by the first amendment they may be offensive but so be it and that comes out of the case of Cohn versus California, where the guy, um, I don't know what kind of language I can use on the uh, <laughs> Anything on you want. <laughs> Anything well, you want. Um, uh, I'll be kind of prudent, where, where a guy walks into a California courthouse, an anti-Vietnam War protester walks in, I guess he was going into a courtroom, with a jacket that said F, the whole word, F the draft. Mm. And uh, he took it off when he went into the courtroom, but he wore it out in the halls. And uh, he was arrested and, and convicted of um, violating a, basically a disorderly conduct ordinance. And the Supreme Court said, no, this is protected speech. He was, if people didn't like what they were seeing, they could avert their eyes. And that's been um, my view of a proper standard uh, when you're talking about advocacies of ideas that people, in ways that people find them offensive, so long as they're, it's not um, kind of provably libelous or uh, something like that. Do you, to bring it to, to present day, like I said, the, the Skokie case is one that I think about often, and as does everyone, in the context of where we are now, almost to take the temperature of the free speech, which seems to be an eternal, you know, tension in any open society of where we draw this line, when we draw this line. Are you, what have you seen since the case? Do you worry about what you're seeing on the streets now with limits on free speech, whether they come from the right or the left? What are you seeing out there now as someone who really stuck your neck well, out I'm there? White and, Nash, you know, one of the things that made the, the Skokie case easier emotionally from the point of view of a lawyer involved with it, um, less of emotional burden than today, is that here you had a band of 50 people yeah. going out into a community that was 50% Jewish and a huge percentage of, a substantial percentage of Holocaust survivors and camp survivors, in fact. Um, it was nonetheless um, in my view, the only violence that was threatened was by onlookers. When you look at the white nationalists today, um, there are patterns of, of physical assaults and mm. threats and so forth that are, are worrisome. And particularly today now with the Second Amendment, uh, when they show up to demonstrations with, I presume, loaded weapons, um, one of the insanities of our Supreme Court, I might add, as an aside. It makes it more volatile in the sense that the, the ability for people to get hurt is greater. Yeah. On the other hand, uh, what happened um, in Charlottesville, to me, is emblematic of had it been handled properly by the police who really bungled it, hmm. it would have been a model for the First Amendment. And what the police did not do was create a skirmish line separating hostile demonstrators from the main demonstration. And to me, uh, if I watched some of it on television, I was amazed that there was no shooting, that the physical altercations in the absence of a needed police presence was trivial except for the one guy 
that drove his car into people that had really nothing to do with the demonstration itself or the execution of the demonstration. It was somebody who clearly had his own agenda. Um, he, he was not extend you know he he was not part of the planned activity so to speak right yes i mean if the charlottesville let's talk about charlottesville if those if that group which was semi-organized had been denied the right to march there uh you would have taken up that case in the same well, as history period. shows and then we're going to get to another question yeah. fairly soon i suspect about the, what the aclu does yeah yeah today. sure but uh, the ACLU did represent the white nationalists in getting them a permit um, in Charlottesville. Now, this was the local affiliate. It may have been the state affiliate. It wasn't the national. But um, it was, on its face, kind of a classic, another classic First Amendment activity. Mm -hmm. uh, it was more threatening than Collins was because there were more of them. And now you could add to the mix weapons. Yeah. Other than that, it was, in terms of the First Amendment principles at stake, it was indistinguishable. Yeah, they were claiming they were going to protest taking down statues and this kind of thing. Right, and yeah. and so far as I could tell, that's what they did. Mm -hmm. It was at the interface between the protesters and the counter demonstrators that you had the violence, not because of the inciting of violence by the um main demonstration on the law they had a perfect right to be there and mm -hmm. a perfect right to advocate what they were advocating there's a heckler's veto doctrine uh, which came out of the 50s essentially which says that when a speaker is so provocative that the police cannot restrain the um on uh, hostile onlookers and the main speaker refuses to leave, then he can be arrested and charged with this orderly conduct or other statute that's applicable. That was not this case, however, because the police disappeared. Yeah. There seems to be such a loophole here to game the system. I mean, it's such a perplexing problem. I'm thinking of like the heckler's veto. Um, I don't know how closely you followed the rash of canceling speakers on college campuses who you That's know awful. yeah yeah but with this heckler's veto as you laid it out there uh and and your words are careful obviously as a as a, a trained lawyer you said if the speaker is so provocative that the reaction will be so volatile that it can't be controlled then then the speaker sort of you know you could shut it down but it seems that if you are someone who dislikes the ideas of charles murray or ben shapiro or something you can you can organize such a violent reaction that seems to somehow prove the point that you were provoked into that violence and therefore it was always the speaker's fault and they should have been shut down in the first place. If you follow that weird circular logic, it seems like a, a perfect way to game the system is to be as loud and, and reactionarily violent as you can somehow implicates the thing that you're actually reacting to. I, don't, um, I, yeah. I think if, if we're completely honest about the system, it's not so easily gained. Okay. Finer versus New York, the heckler's veto case, the, the provocative speaker who on the facts wasn't that provocative, but that's a whole other question for mm -hmm. scholars forever. Uh, nonetheless, he appeared without warning to the authorities. I don't and, know, can you walk through this case? I don't know this case, Finer. Okay. Yeah. Finer was in a park, and he uh, was giving speeches, actually seeking to have people come to a meeting that night, pro-integration and anti-discrimination meeting. But he was cussing out the, uh, the police, the mayor, everybody in the power structure. And the according to the police that arrested him, they became, the onlookers started to become restive. As I recall, someone said, if you don't do something to the police, we're gonna. Uh, although this, as I recall, this may be a stretch of the facts. This guy may have been there with his kid, so I don't know how seriously you take it. But um, in any case, the police then told Finer to leave, and he said no. I've got a First Amendment right, and at which point they arrested him. And in a five to four opinion, the court said, well, there was a clear and present danger on that set of facts because the police, there were only three, I think two or three of them. 
and they couldn't manage the crowd under those circumstances. Hmm. In, in my view, that doesn't create a loophole for the university to, to cut and run when they have speakers that they could easily protect um, with the help, even if um, they need the help of outside law enforcement when there's advanced planning. Because right. if that were the case, those guys could never speak in, in public anywhere using the same device. I think that uh, the universities have have um, have gamed it for the most part and been able usually to avoid getting sued because as I recall there was one case in which they were sued I think in Florida State I may be mistaken somebody might correct that but where they finally did allow one of the provocative speakers on campus because they felt they had no choice under the First Amendment yeah, it seems like in, in every case that you've mentioned where we have this tension, this constant tension of free speech and violence and hate speech, you, you place a lot of onus on police and security to do their job. Are you, are you, is that something that you're worried about more and more that the police either are failing to do their job or they're put in a position where their job is becoming impossible? Maybe by your saying something like, uh, the Second Amendment, having everybody armed to the teeth, their job is becoming more and more difficult to do. Uh, I can't answer that categorically. It seems to me that there is clearly a problem, but it seems to me where you have legitimate protest activities, and I'm talking about the Black Lives Matter protests, mm -hmm. um, and then you have what I regard as entrepreneur rioters who want to loot and fill their pockets and generally raise hell, the police are in a very difficult spot, uh, particularly when there's thousands of legitimate demonstrators in the street. And up until this point, uh, they haven't figured out a way to deal with it effectively. Um, and I'm thinking now about Chicago, where the the rumor went out on the streets on the south side that the police had shot somebody, an unarmed kid, which was false. And so they decided to pile, a bunch decided to pile into cars and loot on the magnificent mile, the, you know, the upper crust uh, commercial area of Chicago, where there was no demonstration in sight. Um, you've got, uh, particularly in the COVID period, and, and with a, a very, very um, incendiary language coming out of the mouth of the president, you have a very volatile time that we're going through. But yeah. most of it is um, the difficulty of separating legitimate demonstrators, of which there are plenty, from looters and rioters, of which there aren't so many. But it's a law enforcement conundrum that I have no answer for. for. Yeah. Uh, at this point, in, in part because law enforcement has run into its own credibility problems and loss of trust, which is, you point out, my comments turn to the police and say they've got to do their jobs. And um, they ultimately did when Colin demonstrated, although he didn't demonstrate in Skokie. But now uh, they're regarded by chunks of protesters as legitimate protesters as the enemy and that's trouble yeah gosh what a what a mess because yeah. i mean this Absolutely. this seems like a we're in a real real bind with all of these forces tying themselves into a knot um and, a, because, and basically in my view a president that's fanning the flames for um political gain yeah and seems to be furthering those divides for political gain right. um because because now yeah you have you have people wanting to claim things like wearing a maga hat is you know equivalent to to a swastika and right, ought to right, have been litigated right. the way that that you were were trying right, to defend right. yeah absolutely i think we're going we are going through a period of turmoil hmm. that may take a while um a long while to resolve hopefully it will not be resolved in the way that um our leaders in washington are attracted to by basically martial law the city officials that are trying to get it under control have got it right that some of this has to be tolerated and and the use of uh, arrests and prosecutions have uh, gradually got to eat away at the willingness of the rioters and the 
um, criminals to uh, to engage in what they've been doing that's been so disruptive. Yeah. So, so what is your, if you have a, from the lessons you've learned, what is your prescription to how do we keep this crucial notion of free speech given all of these forces out there? I mean, what, do you see a path forward? And if so, what are the steps maybe legally, but maybe just sort of politically, how are we going to keep, keep this notion of free speech? I, I think it's probably going to be fine. Um, Good. <laughs> because, um, first of all, I think the Supreme Court standards are going to hold. I don't think the court is going to waffle on the basic principles. And and that's from liberal to conservative. I'm, I'm talking about the entire court. It's not like we're trying to mm-hmm. parse the court the way you would in a five to four decision. Um, and I think that's the starting point. And I think gradually... First of all, COVID is going to be over at some point. The, the fix is not going to be fast, but COVID is going to be over, which is going to uh, take some of the pressure off. And I think that in the meantime, um, uh, municipal governments are going to uh, get more and more skilled at, at dealing with these kinds of events and dealing with uh, the protesters. And one of the things, for example, I read, and I'm a Chicagoan by birth, that is that they raised uh, one of the drawbridges uh, to stop people from flooding mm-hmm. in from the south side. I mean, you, you start to get um, some very smart tactics in c- keeping down the uh, uh, number of riders when they start to uh, appear. Yeah. On the other hand, there's the, one of the risks, of course, implicit in your question is that there's going to maybe overkill. And... Um, I think we're going to swing between extremes until it works itself out. But I'm pretty confident that we're we're going to end up with the same principles we have today. Yeah. Well, uh, on that note, the other case that you're most well known for, you you argued in front of the Supreme Court twice. And I'm going to talk about both of them because the other one uh, I think is related and involved a variable of an anonymous pamphlet. This was McIntyre versus the Ohio. Was it Ohio Ohio Board of Elections? Ohio Election Commission. Yeah. Ohio Election Commission. Um, And the situation there was uh, this woman, Mrs. McIntyre, was handing out pamphlets urging a political position and addressing voters, but it was anonymous. And this was, um, she was fined, what, $100, I think, was the actual fine? Something like that. Yeah, and she brought this to you uh, and the ACLU claiming that this was a, you know, infringement on her free speech. And the the variable in place here that really was before the the court was the anonymous nature of the uh, message, which seems to be, and, and you won this case as well, um, this was a violation of her uh, First Amendment rights. The anonymous thing, this was 1994, right? This is when it was argued. Um, right. The anonymous thing really, really blew up ni- after 94, 95 with uh, the explosion of social media and the internet, where it is quite easy to be anonymous and to say something political. Uh, have your views changed at all seeing the, um, I don't know, a lot of McIntyres out on the internet right now? Um, that's a that's a difficult question. First of all, the McIntyre case itself was about political leaflets. She was mm-hmm. leafleting outside of a, um, a school where there was a, I think, a school board meeting and she was protesting and she was uh, advocating defeat of a, a, a tax levy. And to me, where you're talking about basic leafleting, which is the most, it's kind of one of my law professors characterized leaflets as the poor man's printing press at the time. Now you have, of course, the internet. And I think that if you look at First Amendment law, context matters. And leafleting is very, very different than broadcasting, if you will, via the internet and it strikes me that there are circumstances in which anonymity is not is not and should not be protected Mm -hmm. one of the easiest things for me and uh, again this is uh, areas where because i'm retired i really haven't explored it as thoroughly as i probably Mm -hmm. would like but one of the key principles of the first amendment is false speech has no value. And the kind of 
speech that we're concerned about on the internet is false hmm. and is provably false. And so I don't really worry about advocacy like uh, Margaret McIntyre's as much as I worry about and, and anonymity related to that kind of advocacy. What I worry about more to the point is uh, the spreading of, of lies on the internet. And mm -hmm. I don't think that anyone who spreads lies has any claim to anonymity. And, and so, you're, so you're saying there is a legal principle that spreading lies on the, uh, on the internet or in a leaflet or ever has no value and therefore well, has no it, protection? It, it's a, more, a little bit more sophisticated than that. In, in the context of McIntyre, the principle was uh, that was addressed by the court was whether or not the statute, the Ohio statute was overbroad because mm -hmm. it included leaflets that were not libelous, if you will. So that a libelous leaflet raised different questions. They didn't address how that should be handled, but they just said because it's false speech, the libelous speech is not protected, mm -hmm. but they treated her lawful speech as uh, and legitimate speech as unprotected under the an anonymity law of the state, that the statute was much too broad. So does this relate to, or maybe it's just an opinion question. I know you're retired and I'm asking you like current stuff that is probably very gray right now, but does this apply to like social media bans and people, no. you know? Being no, no, no. Social media are, and that's a real worry. I mean, I, yeah. I have a heretical position on that one. I can't, there are a lot of ACLUers that disagree with me on this. I have no problem with censorship imposed by uh, media companies. It's their property, it's their, it's their platform, and they can let whoever they want to use it, and they can exclude whoever they want to unless there's some legal barrier to them doing so. And the mm. First Amendment is not applicable to their decisions to um, ban people from using Facebook, for example. And and do, I, I, I get the, so I, I agree with you actually, but I'm gonna try to sort of steal man some of my friends who disagree with both of us. Um, I understand your position that there's no legal basis to you know sue Twitter or Facebook or whatever when they ban you. Uh, but is there some sort of principle of free speech that is in, that is being violated there? I'm, I guess I'm talking more, you know, politically and philosophically now. Uh, Nadine Strassen thinks that as a matter of principle, they shouldn't be. be that's why I'm saying I'm a, I may be a heretic. I'm not sure whether she's a heretic or I am. <laughs> um, but she believes that there should be no censorship by the uh, social media companies, that that in principle violates the First Amendment. My view is um, it's their property and they get to do pretty much what they want to do with it uh, within limits. Now, the limitation on what I'm saying, if you're kind of pushed back is, well, what about the phone company? What about um, television and so forth. Well, to the extent that you have principles of common carriers and so forth, I suppose that um, you can argue that the state has power to get in there and regulate. I think the First Amendment protects the ability of Facebook and Twitter and so forth to censor whomever they want to. Is there ever a point where a service, like a private service, like you're saying, it's their property, Twitter, Facebook, is there ever a point where the service becomes so, I don't know, publicly valuable or something, or, or it, that it becomes a bit of a public space, like, like a, uh, a, a common area that we all have somewhat of a right to. I mean, I, I think, and again, this was a recent case that, that I don't know all the details of, but I think there was some legal arguments about Trump banning people or blocking people from his Twitter was possibly a violation because, because his tweets themselves were considered public proclamations because yeah. he is the president, president. And, and so yep. yeah you start getting into these weird legal areas of like wait what is this twitter facebook I, thing I, yeah i mean my own view is and it's my own view is that um that just because they're big doesn't mean the first amendment doesn't give them the right to choose 
who can mm -hmm. speak and who can't within limits now. Mm -hmm. yeah. An example of that is when uh, the Chicago newspapers were sued because they refused to take pro-union labor union ads. Mm -hmm. And the suit argued that they were effectively monopolies in the Chicago area. And this was, of course, before, long before the internet. And when television was strong, but uh, the newspapers had a just incredible clout, and the court said, no, it's not. There are other, mm -hmm. other ways to communicate your ideas, and uh, you better use them. And who says that you can't start another uh, Facebook? And who's to say for, and it's pretty clear now, you know, there's uh, any trust questions, but mm -hmm. there's a reason that Facebook is busily buying up possible com competitors is because they don't want to be uh, technologically obsolete, but they yet may be in 10 years. We may be talking about a completely new TikTok, for starters, mm -hmm. platform. And so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with the position that I take, although I do recognize that others feel that their size and influence requires them to become common carriers or public. Mm public servants i don't think so yeah it's a, i mean it's a moving target which is what all of these things are i mean I if they discriminate based on race i think that can be legislated against but that right. there's no there's no constitutional pr protection for discriminating based on race where there is discriminating based on the content of one's speech or right. one's decisions editorial decisions which are which is what we're talking about and they have editorial decisions are um, constitutionally protected Mm. Do you do you worry again? I'm, I'm asking more of a societal question now as someone who I, I keep imagining the Skokie case now if it came to your door. I know you, I know you would take it ideologically and philosophically. You would do it again in a heartbeat. Do you do you worry that um, maybe in particular the 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 youth out there who are making a lot of noises that that are starting to equate free speech with a right wing position? Um, yeah. Yeah. really are having are losing sight of why it is so important for you again <laughs> Goldberger as as atrocious as you found the content of the message to stand up there are you worried that we're losing sight of that yeah I, I can't couldn't yeah so tell yes. tell me I don't know I, I am well, I, I worry that the uh, ACLU uh, is gonna be is ducking hard mm -hmm. cases uh, I and I'm there is a growing movement to emulate the European approach to mm. freedom of speech, which is essentially if speech is discriminatory, if it, if it, if it incites hostility, try that one. If you mm. incite hostility, which is a feeling, not a conduct, mm. that it can be punished. And, you know, the example, one of the prime examples is a guy spent, was sentenced to two years, I can't remember his name, an, an English ersatz, historian who wrote a book claiming that the Holocaust never occurred mm -hmm. and he was sentenced to two years in jail for publishing that book. He spent a year in jail for publishing it. He was let out a year early. Uh, mm -hmm. To me, those are absurd outcomes. And I think the European system is more reflective of the fears of fascism and Nazism than it is of a, a realistic sense of uh, where the boundaries ought to be. It, it seems you're echoing the principle of uh, you're, you're sort of like the way that Skokie reacted, the town of Skokie reacted to the Nazis actually was the biggest gift to the Nazis who wanted to march there. Cause Absolutely. it was literally like, yeah. it was yeah. like 30, 30 bozos who were going to walk around with their dumb shirts and no one was going to care. But then suddenly they were on the front page of every paper for a month or more and getting the publicity <laughs> that they craved. It seems, um, the, the backfire effect, it's so tempting to want to shut down the speech, but is that is that sort of the message and the lesson that we should be keeping from, well, from something uh, like that? Well, it's more complicated than that. Yeah. I, to me, counter demonstration and counter protests, which, which is what developed out of this, uh, is also a way of communicating a message. And uh, there is a likelihood of your protest backfiring if you take the longer view, and, and what happened was I began to get mail, uh, some mail, not, not a lot of letters, but two cases of people that were 
Holocaust survivors who said, you were right because we want to know where our enemies are and who they are. And the only way we mm. can do that is if we can see them. Mm. Um, but the other thing that happened was that the Jewish community coalesced around the case and began to raise money to build a Holocaust museum. And there's just a spectacular Holocaust museum in Skokie right now. Hmm. And yeah. so you could say that um, if you waited long enough, um, they prevailed. Yeah. Uh, but not the way that they tried to prevail. They didn't shut it down, but uh, their own views were presented and amplified. How, how hard was it for you to, to um, in that moment? I mean, it's, uh, listen, I, I, t I think your position is great. I, like I said, I think you're, you're, you've played a heroic role in the history of free speech and you should be proud of it. But in that moment, how hard was it to be the guy who was, who was their lawyer? Um, you must have been, were you getting death threats? Was it that bad? You must have been I getting... got some, I got some threats of violence. Uh, the, what did they call the, the Jewish Defense League showed up at our office with ball bats um, oh, wow. and waved them around and left. I talked to the sheriff of Cook County and he was not always wise. In fact, he could be sometimes foolish, but I talked to him about the possibility of getting a gun license so that I'd have it with me. And he said, don't oh. do it. He said, if if you make a mistake and hurt somebody by accident, you'll never be able to live with yourself. So I didn't. So there were, you know, there, there were eggs thrown at my house. I found a couple of broken eggs on the front doorstep when after the demonstration occurred because it, it was moved to Chicago where it could be handled mm -hmm. much more effectively. So um, and it was one of the reasons I was wary about uh, your call to talk about this. <laughs> when you call because I've been through some interviews where it's just um, where the interviewer is playing the uh, a game of gotcha to, in terms of seeing if there can be insults uh, oh, wow. tossed about because some people, I don't know at this point, there's a lot of time has passed, but I had some pretty unpleasant experiences hmm. during the whole thing. But um, you just put your head down and keep going. Because I, yeah. it, to me, there was never it, two things were going on. First of all, the ACLU family was wonderful and supportive, and uh, it, uh, and second, my own extended family was terrific, mm. and I really believed that it was the right thing. So I didn't. Uh, my only question, I felt bad because when I began to talk to the survivors in Skokie, as angry and and nasty as some of them were. I really felt for them. I understood. Yeah. And that was that was the toughest part. It's a tough you were in a tough, tough position. Um, I want to I want to I, I, I don't know how people could could be trying to play gotcha games. I mean, the difference between being <laughs> a defender of someone or of a principal versus a, a sympathizer for their views is a line that we just have to keep in focus if we're going to keep this country or any open democracy oh. together. Uh, and I guess it's easier said than done, especially when it's as emotionally fraught as something that yeah, that you yeah. that that you had to go through. So th so there is feelings for that. I mean, it was I don't know if I if I read this right, but I don't know if you, if they actually were going to march in Skokie. You you and others from the ACLU who had just defended their right to do so were planning to stand in the counter protest against them, which I think well, is that would have been my position. My act, I mean, that, that was, if it was safe, <laughs> I, I was pleased that there was going to be a counter protest. Um, I'm not sure I would have, uh, there, there may have been some of my colleagues. In fact, some of them may have been there. I didn't, I didn't check. Mm. Um, I knew it wouldn't be safe for me to be right. in, in the counter protest. So I just, uh, uh, I just hold up during the period of the uh, actual demonstration. Yeah. So one last thing, this is a crazy year for all of us, of course, with COVID and everything is very wild in this country. Uh, it is also an election year. Are you worried heading into this election year that that all of these lines 
um, the, especially the free speech lines are re, are are. I know you, you have optimism that the courts will hold, but will society hold, or or are we at a brittle point? Are we gonna, are we going to make it through twenty twenty? Is my question. My my question. My answer to your question is not going to be based on the First Amendment. My my concern basically is is that um, we become so polarized. Yeah. The leadership of at least one political party has decided that polarization is a way to win the election. Mm -hmm. That I wonder about the stability of basic democratic institutions, particularly if he wins. Um, but that's not going to be because they shut down the lines of communication. It's going to be um, because there's going to be violence. Yeah, yeah. One one other thing you mentioned before I let you go. You say you worry that the ACLU is starting to duck difficult cases. Do you do you feel like naming any of those? I mean, I, I have my eye on a few. Um, I can't I know. can't say what I what I do know is that um, and there's a story about this I think in the New York Times or there's a podcast in the New York Times that mm -hmm. um, about about the ACLU uh, problems and the staff pushback on. Mm -hmm. Um, representing extreme right-wing clients, and that is that what the ACLU did was, um, as it should have, diversify its staff ethnically, uh, in terms of gender, and race, and so forth. But some of the folks that came aboard um, identify with the clients, right? And and I think that their view is that the ACLU should not be expending resources representing extremists like the Nazis and uh, the white nationalists and so forth because there are other more important ways to uh, expend your resources. And to me, it's just um, a covert way of saying we really don't think the First Amendment is that important, and I worry about that. Yeah, jeez. Um, I did see, I mean, I don't know if, I mean, you said something really well there. I thought of identifying with the client rather than maybe identifying with the principle that the client is bringing to you, which is a really interesting way and a mindset for a lawyer to be a, a constitutional lawyer and a lawyer like yourself, a civil liberties lawyer, um, is to not get too attached to the personal story and skin color or anything that's in front of you. Um, but stick with the principle that's being brought to you. Yeah, uh, at least if you're a civil liberties and a civil rights lawyer, I think that that's what, particularly a civil liberties lawyer, I think that's what you need to do. That's fair. Now I yeah. ask you, and you relieve. I tried. I said that, and I said it. Did I say it delicately enough so that it's clear that I understand what's going on and I have yeah. some emotional sympathy for it? But I think it's wrong institutionally for the ACLU to let that happen. I think people that feel that way ought to go to work for organizations that are specifically designed so that the lawyers can identify with their client. And there are plenty of them, you know, I'm thinking of uh, the NAACP, you know, Legal Defense Fund, you mm -hmm. know, and fighting for integration of public schools. I mean, those lawyers were identifying with their clients and. And they should have. Yeah. But when you're in the civil liberties business, you're talking about neutral principles of law. And neutral principles means these principles apply to everybody, no matter who they are. And yeah, the point is that politically, if, you're, if your donors and your constituents are enraptured by a certain fervor for identity poli politics, perhaps this is a bigger issue of just the Democratic Party and what's happening to the left. And the question is more like, are, are is is the extreme left ver parts of the conversation starting to infringe upon some of these deeply held principles and maybe, um, you know, demanding what side of a very complicated issue you take, as was the Skokie case is, is complicated, demanding that you take a certain side now uh -huh. before uh -huh. even thinking clearly about it? Well, I, to me... Um I'm less worried about the pressure from the, let's say, the progressives, although I, I'm not one. I disagree with them lots. I feel that the pendulum is going to swing back and forth and back and forth at, until these things get worked out. And the, and the final 
location of the workout or the final line isn't yet going to be clear, but no matter where you put it, someone's going to get hurt. So that, to me, um, I think it's important not to be afraid, which is what I worry about with political moderates and political people left of center, that they're uncomfortable standing up to uh, folks who take extreme positions. And um, they've got to get over it. Uh, you yeah. know, they simply have to, you know, and just let, then let the, let the chips fall where they may. I mean, mm-hmm. I, that was the whole thing of Skokie. I kept saying, yes, I know it hurts, but there are a lot of other psychic traumas that we experience. How mm-hmm. about a woman that uh, uh, runs off with uh, her husband's best friend? Is that going to be punishable by, uh, you know, by, by law? I mean, there are a lot of traumas that we have in life, but no, and I'm not sure that we're going to get an answer that's ever satisfactory because someone's going to get fried no matter what happens. Yeah. Well. All right. Well, on on that, I think happy note. <laughs> well, uh, we we could part ways here again. I I think we can't remind people enough about the lessons of Skokie. It is a complicated case, even all these all these years later. Um, but without what without what your position in it, we would be lacking a, a huge, huge hero who was willing to stand no. up for a principal. So um, thank you. I appreciate the applause, but I'm not sure it's that so much as that the importance of Skokie was that it demarcated a, a pretty bright line in yeah. terms of defending uh, views that we hate. Yeah, it was just an absolute pleasure talking to you. Um, Pleasure talking to you. I appreciate it. Take care. Here's my closing thoughts. I haven't really dived headfirst into the culture wars and cancel culture arguments on this podcast quite yet, and I don't really intend to. I hope Dilemma is a kind of zoomed out place for all of us to think about life and the complex problem of existing. But we can't avoid bumping into each other in that existence. And that is where that thing called political theory necessarily emerges. Goldberger hints cautiously in our conversation about a potential drift in the ACLU. I think a lot of us have seen this. He puts it carefully with a concern that there is a trend within the organization to kind of empathize with the client rather than the principal. I really like that insight. If you rewind the clock to 1977 when Frank Collins walks in the door and you swap David Goldberger out with someone who fits more of that description, you know, a vile neo-Nazi might just be rejected outright, that it's just untouchable, or perhaps, as the argument famously goes, gets punched. This, I think, is really a problem. Many organizations have degraded their positions under this same shift. The Southern Poverty Law Center basically poisoned itself to irrelevancy by embracing a kind of identity-driven cultural relativism, which horrendously led them to slime the reputations of people like Majid Nawaz. The loss of the SPLC as a legitimate organization I don't think was all that consequential, though. They served as a valuable resource for news organizations for decades and did the exhaustive investigation work into certain groups to create a sort of reference book for busy newsrooms to cite and help navigate the lines between terrorist groups, hate groups, free speech advocates, and genuine freedom fighters, and they did a pretty decent job. But the role is somewhat replaceable by internet sleuths and now easily accessible firsthand accounts. Uh, I'm not sure we suffer much from the fall of the SPLC, but I think the ACLU would be a really different story. I don't think yet that it's a lost cause. As Goldberger mentioned, they still helped arrange legal work for the marches in Charlottesville, so there's still plenty of that skoky principle defending ideas left in there. A quick glance at their current cases reveals plenty of worthy efforts to defend civil liberties, both large and small. They still do things like represent the American Humanist Association, who filed a case against the American Legion in Maryland after they erected a 40-foot-tall Latin cross in the center of a busy intersection, or demand that a court order governments to turn over records concerning surveillance and police tactics, or defend people who have been fired for being gay, like Don Zarda, who was fired by Altitude Express, a skydiving company in Long Island. I really don't think we can lose the ACLU, but 
the very early warning signs are there. Perhaps, not surprisingly, these warning signs are pressured by the hysteria in society around claims of things like racism and transphobia. Some of the trouble also stems from, of course, Donald Trump. Much of the ACLU's docket is taken up by the energy required to push back against the civil liberties being threatened by Trump's coddling of the religious right and the reckless use of executive power. There are cases where the civil liberties of marginalized groups come into conflict, and it's not at all obvious to me whose liberties, if anyone's, really need defending in some of them. Here's two examples recently taken up by the ACLU. One is a case in Idaho. I have my close eye on it. Lindsay Hecox is a college student at Boise State, and she is transgender, born biological male. She is unable to run on the university's track team because of Idaho Bill number 500. If Hecox is allowed to run and defeats the biological women competing against her regularly, and they miss out on prize money or financial gain in their athletic careers, would they have a case to present to the ACLU that their civil liberties were infringed upon? It's certainly complicated, and you have the liberties of two groups at various degrees of marginalization pitted against each other, one transgender individuals and the other women. Uh, I have my opinions about how this case ought to be settled, but I'm a bit dismayed that it was entirely predictable which identity the ACLU built their case around. And in another troubling anecdote, an Oregon county exempted non-white people from face mask mandates in the middle of COVID in order to avoid uh, racial profiling. The argument went something like wearing a mask while being black increases one's risk of being a target of violence or unjust harassment. Therefore, the risk to the community of this person not wearing a mask is permissible. Uh, the ACLU helped draft and defend this policy. The community pushed back, and the city actually dropped the exemption, but the pushback was characterized by the ACLU as horrendously racist uh, by the same lawyer who helped draft the ordinance. So, yikes. I mean, this is pretty dangerous early warning sign stuff. But if we lose the ACLU to this kind of culture war madness, I think we're really in big, big trouble. I don't see anything out there ready to take its place. And it still really does do some fantastic work. So to leave you with another quote about free speech, to mirror the ones I used in the intro, here is Supreme Court Justice John Marshall Harlan in a case that we mentioned in the episode. It was his opinion in the Cohen versus California case, the one where this guy, Paul Cohen, was charged with disturbing the peace uh, by wearing his jacket, which read, fuck the draft, in a public corridor in a California courthouse. So the, the quote is quite a bit longer than the ones in the opening, but it is also one for us to hold dear. The constitutional right of free expression is powerful medicine in a society as diverse and populous as ours. It is designed and intended to remove governmental restraints from the arena of public discussion. Putting the decision as to what views shall be voiced largely into the hands of each of us in the hope that use of such freedom will ultimately produce a more capable citizenry and more perfect polity, and in the belief that no other approach would comport with the premise of individual dignity and choice upon which our political system rests. To many, the immediate consequence of this freedom may often appear to be only verbal tumult, discord, and even offensive utterance. These are, however, within established limits, in truth, necessary side effects of the broader enduring values which the process of open debate permits us to achieve. That the air may at times seem filled with verbal cacophony is, in the sense, not a sign of weakness, but of strength. We cannot lose sight of the fact that, in what otherwise might seem a trifling and annoying instance of individual distasteful abuse of a privilege, these fundamental societal values are truly implicated. So long as the means are peaceful, the communication need not meet standards of acceptability. Those words were written in 1971, and 50 years later, they're even more salient. 
So there you go. Next week is Art with Swoon, which gets back into the mysteries of mind and consciousness and ponders the question of what art is and why it might hold the key to our humanness. We have a really, really exciting stretch of guests coming up on Dilemma, and it includes Cass Sunstein uh, on his brand new book, Too Much Information, John Wertheim on Behavior Economics of Sports, Susan Blackmore on Memes and Memetics, uh, and more. So it's just going to be a lot of fun. I'm really excited about this stretch, and you'll hear those episodes very soon.